David, to explore aesthetic cognitivism, what I like to do is to look at what are the intellectual foundations of it? What are the categories of knowledge that we need to know out of which the aesthetic cognitivism can emerge? So one is cognitive science, um, obviously. Uh, another may be epistemology. And if we want to extend aesthetic cognitivism into religion, which some do, which you do, which I appreciate, um, then maybe philosophical theology, an analytical approach of how it's going on. So as you see these different foundations, uh, how do you reflect on them? Well, I, I certainly want to say that science has a, a role and various sciences can, can have a role in investigating this. Um, so, um, to give it a contemporary context, there's the argument about to what extent were left-wing and right-wing brain people. Um, and uh, the current argument is often that the left side of the brain has dominated too, too much um, Western thinking as rationalistic and, and so on. And the, that's the, a little simplistic, even the, though my, my doctorate in neuroscience is 50 years yes. old, I can tell you that's a little bit well, simplistic. Well, yes, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to uh, make it, <laughs> and for a non-scientist like myself, as simple as possible. So the question is, can you then investigate the different kinds of ways of thinking that are yeah. non-rationalist? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and that would be a scientific question. Um, in particular, um, symbolist approaches to thinking. So, I mean, child psychology used to say, um, um, say this is a very old book, but Piaget's The Moral Judgment of a Child, 1936 or something like that, um, said that the child starts with symbolism, but to grow up <laughs> is to become rational. Uh, um, um, but it might be that the, the two should be held together. Um, and that, that uh, so this is the argument of Ian McGilchrist in The Master and the Emissary, for example, uh, who's a psychiatrist, that this is what needs to be recovered, this other side. Um, and if so, that would help um, the arts and religion, because, in my view at least, um, it's both are characterized by more symbolist ways of thinking. Um, so there's a role for science, but I'm not a scientist, I immediately say. So I would then have to approach it by saying, um, is there a role for philosophical theology or other types of theology? And I would say, yes, because we can then start asking, um, how do symbols work? Just thinking of it at um, uh, the non-scientific level, you know, when, when we're talking with one another. And here's where one of my worries with the traditional approach of analytic philosophy would um, come, that it's, this sounds terribly patronizing, but it would sound, it's too simplistic. So it's almost as though the metaphor has to be cached, and mm -hmm. then you've got the answer mm -hmm. to what that metaphor means. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to misunderstand how a poem works. Its metaphors achieve their success by being open-ended. So, so, so far from vagueness being a bad thing, it's a good thing because it opens up different possibilities. Or if you have a painting, it's not that it means one thing, but that it can then open other ways of looking at things. So you may take at one time something from a poem and at, or a painting or whatever, or a work of literature, and at another something quite different. Well, the classic critique of literary criticism is that the critic reads more into the, 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 the artwork than the artist had in mind uh, in any respect. But, but you're saying there may be some legitimacy in that. Oh, I'm wanting to say definitely there's legitimacy because um, many artists have, uh, would be very happy. I don't think they would necessarily be happy with uh, the professional critics who sometimes overdo this, but um, they would certainly be happy with the notion that there's more in what they write um, than um, simply their intention. Um, so 
a nice example of that is T.S. Eliot um, uh, reading his poems, because so, he was once asked, you know, why read them with such a flat voice? And that's because he said, I don't want to have one interpretation. Yeah, you know, there's the right. openness there to other possibilities yeah, yeah. if I don't impose my own meaning. And equally, in terms of religion, I'd want to say that's the great mistake that's happened in the modern world of the narrowing that there's only one meaning, and that's what um, a particular passage in scripture or whatever means. So I've resisted that all my life. Well, so that's very significant. So in that way, the arts can free religion from a, 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 an artificial constraint? Yes, yes, that's, that's precisely why I, th I think the arts are actually a great hope for religion, because the more they can relate to them, they might actually rediscover themselves. Because historically, religions have changed. So it's not the case that Christianity now is like what it was in the first century or whatever. There's been huge changes, and that's because it's been open and developing. Whereas um, from the 19th century, um, there was fundamentalism of different kinds. So there was the fundamentalism of it's all literally true, but there are equally the fundamentalism of the biblical scholar who wants sure. to say it means this one thing. Well, why should it mean just one thing? Um, but but is, it, is it not meaning the one thing because we are unable to find it or that it legitimate really has multiple meanings? It legitimately has more than one meaning. Um, so the, the author isn't the final arbiter of a poem. Um, so it's obviously important to, to look at the way uh, a poet um, might have intended something. But what gives the poem the power is not just the artist's intention. It's actually the artifact that they've produced which is why you can't reduce. So you can't say, here's what the poem means. You don't have to read the poem anymore, because mm -hmm. otherwise you've got a puzzle about what the arts are about. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, if a poem is possible to translate a poem into ordinary prose, why bother reading the poem? <laughs> right. It's because it's non-reducible. There's yeah. something there that's going to be open to later possibilities. Do, does this mean from the articulation between the arts and religion, if we're, if we're uh, constrained by a philosophical, theological, and anal an analytic uh, approach to theology, does that limit our uh, capacity to understand the relationship between art and religion? Well, th th that's certainly the danger. I don't think there's anything inherently um, within analytic philosophy or analytic theology or whatever that would impose such a restraint. Um, but that in the way in terms of which it's been practiced, um, then there is such a restraint. So if we take a different issue like arguments for the existence of God, um, um, both um, those in favor and those against thought that there were certain formal arguments that could be bandied back and forth. And What's interesting in recent years is the number of atheist philosophers who also said, and people like Dawkins and so on, have got it wrong because that's not how religion works. In fact, uh, it's about, a, say, a search for meaning that's been ignored in the traditional analyses. Mm. So, um, so provided analytic philosophy is willing to open up to that, then that's okay. But equally in the arts, um, you have to ask this um, further question that the search for precise definition isn't the guarantee <laughs> no. of truth that traditionally analytic philosophy has thought it was, that things are going to be missed otherwise.